Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Glad you could join me. What are you doing for training these days? Or are you? <laughs> Maybe fishing has taken a priority. I don't know. This time of year, it's kind of schizophrenic around here. Trying to balance both of those. Oh, and then make a living too. Can you relate? <laughs> hey, well, you can relate to some of the things you're going to learn this week on the program. Sharon Potter joins us. She's with Red Branch Kennels. She's half of the Rick Smith Sharon Potter writing team in Pointing Dog Journal. So we will learn a lot about how they train dogs and how they communicate that to schlumps like us. So looking forward to hearing from Sharon and uh, finally getting to know her a little bit better. And so will you. But that's not all. We've got the Upland Nation glossary. We're up to the letter P. We'll also go to Facebook and discuss our bad bird hunting habits. Maybe you learn to avoid some of those, or maybe they are yours. We'll find out coming up on the Upland Nation podcast. And as always, a public access suggestion for you, this time from Western Kansas, a spot I know and love. Can't wait to get back there, maybe as soon as this season. Well, I alluded to training, and uh, maybe you're deep into it. Uh, if you're lucky, your dog is beyond all that, and all you're doing is tuning him up. But poor little Flick, he is, you know, he's working hard at it. I shouldn't call him a poor little Flick because he's doing a great job, but it's a slow process, this whole steadiness thing. Now, steadiness is relative depending on what you want out of your dog. I want him to be steady on birds while they fly, while they get shot, and while they hit the ground, that's the hard part. But we're getting there, and I talked a little bit about that last week and uh, was just reminded yet again on a more general basis in a discussion I had with a couple other dog trainers a while back that it's all about relationships. And I know Ronnie Smith and Susanna Love talked about it last week, and we've talked about it a lot before, but the idea that you build a bond with your dog through certain things, mostly physical things, but then there's that emotional connection that kind of wells up as a result of that. And and the thing with Flick that I've seen is this whole idea of a whole bunch of positive bird contacts. Yeah, you got to stage manage them very carefully, but if you do that and you have the gear and you have the birds, you can put a whole bunch of birds on the ground and get a whole bunch of great performances out of your dog, no matter what the level they're at. And that in turn leads to a dog that is willing to take your direction, if you will, looks at you as a leader and is basically willing to cut you a little bit of slack when you do screw up. But the idea being, and it matter it matters not what you're training. What matters is you have a whole bunch of very positive iterations of something with very few negative iterations. Make any sense? Well, it does, especially if you think about, um, well, the grandfather of all the folks we've been talking to the last couple weeks, if you will, philosophically at least, and the uncle and the father for some. Delmar Smith said it best. He said, never give a bird dog a chance to fail. So if you're always working towards every training instance being positive, that dog is going to believe you when you tell him there's a dead bird out there and you want him to go get it. Yeah, I know it's a long journey. Just remember that getting there is half the fun. We're made possible by Roughland Performance Kennels, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns from LegacySports.com, Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, the Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and FurFeathersFriends.com. That's my initiative to get you outside and to bring somebody else along with you. Well, if you listened for a while, if you watch my TV show uh, every once in a while, you'll realize that Western Kansas was one of my 
bucket list destinations over and over. It's a big bucket, okay? <laughs> but they're on the list a lot. We've been invited to the Governor's uh, Ringneck Classic Invitational Hunt several times, made a few episodes there, made some great friends, and s- learned a lot of history as well. So if you ever get the chance, take advantage of that. But one of the towns that hosts that Ringneck Classic every once in a while has become, well, one of my stopovers when I'm going back and forth, at least for a day or two, and that's Goodland, Kansas, in Sherman County. Kansas has a great walk-in program, excellent support through their hard copy and their app of their hunting atlas. And that program is growing by the year. So it's worth it in and of itself. There's a lot of great acreage out there that you might want to take a look at. Wheat, sunflower, a lot of CRP, and a lot of ringnecks. And the joy of Kansas in general is the limit is four. You buy a license for a whole year. Yeah, not like some of those other states. You can buy the license, and I've done it a few times. Go late in the season one year and then come back early in the season the next year. Your license is good for 365 days. The other nice thing about it is it's a little bit further south than some of those big pheasant states, and so the weather is a little better, a little bit longer. Goodland, Kansas, it's on my list. It might be on your list to one of those great public access places to put on your bucket list. Sageandbreaker.com is where you sign up for the mailing list. Sage and Breaker gun care products are crafted at the highest caliber. You get on the mailing list, you get first notice of sales and new products coming down. Always free shipping on everything they sell from cleaning and lubrication protection, hardware tools, cases, you name it, Sage and Breaker gun care products. They've got the best of the best heirloom quality gear. Sage and breaker.com and i just shot a new video it'll be out soon on behalf of pointer shotguns from legacysports.com you want to learn more about them well watch the video you won't be able to miss it it'll be everywhere but also go to legacysports.com slash pointer the one i used in that video is a acreus over and under <clears throat> with a bronze cerakote finish yeah It'll be little, it'll look a little different on TV, but that's the coolest part of it. If you're like me, you're always looking for a little higher level of protection and that's one way to do it on your gun finish. And also it's fun to look a little bit different than the rest of the guys in the field. They've got a full line of semi-autos over and unders, youth guns. They got high end entry level target field guns, all available with that Cerakote finish. Learn more about pointer shotguns at legacysports.com slash pointer all right yeah that's what i said and here we go it's a pleasure to have sharon potter with us today sharon is the proprietor of red branch kennels you know her name as half of the writing team along with rick smith at pointing dog journal they have been writing that column forever and if you're like me you've learned most of your dog training from people like these folks who are experts in their field sharon is also a team hunt smith instructor that's the whole scheme that the smith cousins uh put together that really i mean it rings i mean we know that she's written for retriever journal and gun dog among others uh an interesting background before that and many many things that we got to talk about so sharon potter welcome to the upland nation podcast Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. This will be fun. It will. And like I said, I've enjoyed your work for a long time. And, uh, uh, you you know, it's one of the things that is most important to most of us who are on or listening to this show most of the time. We all want our dogs to be great dogs, depending on what that means. But let's start with the really fun stuff. Recount your most memorable bird hunt of the last few years. Oh, gosh. 
I know. <laughs> Narrow it down. It's like you, you know, which, which who's your favorite child? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man, you know, I think one of the the best ones that really sticks in my mind was a pheasant hunt in Kansas. Um, I was hunting with a friend. He had a lab, and it was kind of one of those cold, windy, thirty-two degree days. The wind's blowing sideways, and he was with his lab, Sam, and I had my old Chessie crash. And he knocked a bird down and sailed across the river. And his dog wouldn't go in the water to get it. And so I sent my chassis. He swam that river, tracked it about 150, maybe 200 yards down a fence row. It took probably 30 minutes by the time it was all done and brought that bird back. And I ended up selling that guy a chassis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so it was really a commercial opportunity. <laughs> well, it was. But, you know, really the most memorable ones for me are when I get pictures back from clients, especially kids with their first gun dog. And they send me pictures of their dog I trained with them and their first bird. And that really gets me right in the, right in the heart. What? Why is that? What is What is it about that connection? And it's it's complicated, I understand. But to you, what is that? Well, for me, it's it's the joy of seeing young people come into the sport and enjoying their dog and understanding how it works. And then, you know, there's a little pride of training in there, too, you know, knowing that that dog can do the work and that everybody's happy. And I don't know, there's just something really special about it. I get all sorts of pictures every year from all the different dogs. What did they what did they say when they send you a picture? There, there's obviously a note or a caption or all of the above, maybe an four page letter for all I know. What are, what did they say about that? It's usually something very simple. Um, you know, like Jack got his first bird with the with with Joseph, the dog you trained for him. Um, picture of you know, it's just a picture and a quick, usually a sentence or two. Um, sometimes they'll have a question or they'll they'll yeah, just commentary. It's it's really nothing deep or serious. You know, it's funny. I, I, one of the goals on the podcast here is to is to have the commentary just to to relate the stories and um and that's exactly what i see on on social media for example with us is uh we just want to tell the stories to somebody don't we well that's it um i remember one time i trained a Brittany for a a, a father and son up in the upper peninsula the son was gonna it's just old enough to start hunting and I said, now send me a picture of, of the dog and their first bird. And the son got a woodcock, and there's a picture they sent me. The son's holding the bird, and the Brittany's standing next to him, and the dad's shaking so hard the camera's a blur. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. It, it, that just really hits home, and it's absolutely true. I, I'm doing a, a, a thing this year called Fur Feathers Friends for the – this is a somewhat annual thing we do where we in, encourage other pe- uh, hunters to take somebody new. And I got four emails this morning talking about exactly that. And, and I can see th- what's going to happen there. Those stories are going to come out of there. And, and I, you know, when I'm not chasing birds or, or uh, waving a fly rod around in a stream, I'm looking for petroglyphs and pictographs. And you know what they okay. are? They're they're yeah. the, they're the prehistoric version of what you just related. Some dad sending a picture to the dog trainer about a wonderful hunt that they both did. How cool is that? Isn't it? <laughs> Seriously. So now you know the funnest the funnest new people for me though. Every year at the end of the last weekend in August, and I'm starting to do a few more across the different areas of the country. I do a ladies only workshop. For oh yeah, two days. yeah. And we have, there are women there. I had a, um, a lady come a couple of years ago. She was a show person, had never hunted. And at the end of the seminar or the workshop, she went home, started working on her dog, and she said, the heck with this showing, I want to hunt. Oh, man, you, and, you're and, persona and non grata that. at the AKC now, aren't you? <laughs> doesn't matter. Yeah. That's what the dogs are built for. But, you know, it gets a lot of women out there. There, a lot of them are first-time hunters. Yeah, they're new to this. They want, but they're if they go to a regular seminar, and, and not, you know, I, Rick is always great about people, and so is Ronnie and Susanna. You know, including everybody. But a lot of times, there's going to be 30 guys and one woman, and the yeah. woman hangs back and mm-hmm. doesn't really participate. So I decided, you know, ladies only, and this way everybody has a good time. Nobody feels intimidated, and we really have fun with it. And it introduces more women to hunting, yeah. and a trained dog. 
you know, um, I, I did a lot of that back in the day on the fly fishing side. I was, I was invited to be a speaker at a lot of those, uh, out in the West, we call them women in the outdoors. Yeah. Pretty soon they decided even men instructors weren't a good idea for the very reason you just des- described. But what, what, what can we do as males if we're um, trying to get, uh, you know, a spouse or a, a, a girl child or whatever involved in the outdoors, what do you learn from that ladies only seminar that we might be able to use? Oh gosh, there are so many moving parts there. Yeah. I think for a lot of it, some of the women that come, they're women that haven't hunted before. They're bringing mm-hmm. their husband's dog mm-hmm. and they really aren't all that thrilled about the husband hunting. But when they see how much the dog loves doing what they do, then they understand and they kind of flip the switch a little bit. Um, as far the women, women tend to be a little more tentative as far as making corrections or giving cues. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something I try to step up with. I try to explain things in a little different manner than they're used to. Um, I think just it's just a matter of including everybody. And one of the things I do, and it's it's a little different, everybody participates in every single dog's workout. It's all individualized, but everybody comes with every dog and watches. And then when everybody's worked their dog, we kind of get back into a circle, sit down in our chairs, and I go around and ask everybody what they saw about each dog. And everybody has a chance to comment on every dog because they learn by observing all the other dogs, things that they can take back to their own dog. Amen to that. And it's absolutely true. But the key to that is exactly what you just said. And that is not just watching it, but being an active watcher that knows there's a final exam at the end of all the watching. Right. That's how I learned to be a music teacher. Really? <laughs> he videotaped us every day and then we all oh. had to watch each other oh i don't remember that in my college music days oh uh, well <laughs> we were the pioneers you know this is back when the videotape machines were run by hamsters on treadmills oh gosh yeah i think i was even before that oh i doubt it <laughs> well that is my degree in music <laughs> oh so. no kidding well we got a lot more yeah. to talk about but we won't do it here <laughs> Singer or player? Player. Brass. Low brass or high brass? French horn. Worse than both. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, okay. I was a, uh, uh, Technically, I was a tuba player, but uh, I ended up having to play a lot of other things for other bands, too. But, okay, we, we got another entire discussion later on. Uh, but uh got it but for now let's 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 leave that as the background music so to speak um all right now the really hard questions all right over and under or side by side side by side flusher or pointer depends on the game waterfowl or upland upland okay we're gonna get along pretty good all right (laughs) So, so how, how, to, to describe your story, how did you get here? I mean, today, Sharon Potter, Red Branch Kennels, part of the Rick Smith, Sharon Potter writing team. But that's not where it started. It started way back in some other worlds, I'm sure, besides French horn playing. Yeah, well, my parents tell me that from the time I could talk, my second or third word was horse. <laughs> and... I was obsessed. I decided from the time I could walk, I was going to train horses for a living, and they disagreed with that, but I did it anyway. Mm. Um, and for many years, I trained and showed horses all across the U.S., um, all the way to the national level, trained um, horses for amateur riders, etc. And I always had a gun dog of my own, mm-hmm. Chesapeake's, of course. And that was just my fun in the fall when show season was done. Anyway, I happened to, I had a horse client, Marty Smith from Foster and Smith, the old pet catalog. That oh, used to be out sure. There. Yeah. Yeah. His daughter rode with me um, as a student. They had horses with me in training and Marty knew I had a gun dog and he said, I always host a Rick Smith seminar. You should come out and watch this and meet this guy. So I did. And I still laugh about this because the first thing I saw when I got there, because I was not a participant, I was just hanging in the background are a bunch of people leading these dogs around with a piece of rope. (laughs) And I thought, oh, my gosh, what kind of – this is – no, this is ridiculous. Anyway, I thought, all right, I need to click the trainer part of me on and pay attention. 
and I talked to Rick a little bit, and then I ended up buying one. I thought, well, what the heck? If the worst that'll happen is that piece of rope will hang in the shed somewhere. And it turned out it was a pretty useful tool, and now that's all I use. Anyway, um, Marty and his wife invited me to dinner with Rick later on, and I got to talk to Rick more. And he'd always talked about wanting to have something, some writing done. And I said, well, I've done some horse stuff. So I connected with Rick, um, started assisting him at some of the seminars I could get to, you know, I could get away from my job, and started writing for Pointing Dog Journal. And that was, I think, 2001. Yeah, that was, um, that was a while back. I rem- I think I remember when you first started doing that, yeah. Yeah, it was a while back. Meanwhile, um, the people that my dad worked for, and people I've known for years and years, raised English setters and had a great piece of property, and they invited me out to use the property, and I got to know a little more about pointing dogs. And <laughs> from there, people started, when the article started coming out, people started asking me to, for help training their dog. Hmm. So I thought, you know, I'm not getting any younger here. I don't bounce as well as I used to. (laughs) And while a dog might bite me, it won't put me in a wheelchair. So over the course of a few years, in about 2003, 2004, I gradually eased out of the horses professionally and into training bird dogs. I bet you see some parallels. Oh, there are tons. If you ask Delmer, he'll he'll tell you the same thing. He started with horses. Exactly, yeah. So it's it's kind of almost in sort of in your DNA too then. Um, Oh, gosh, yes. I have to laugh because when I was still showing Marty's daughter Hannah's horses, um, we were at Youth Nationals in Oklahoma City. And keep in mind, back then I didn't know anybody in the pointing dog world. I was complete novice to that pointing dog thing. It was always retrievers. And so Marty took me out to this friend of his his place. The guy's name was Delmer Smith. <laughs> I had no clue who Delmer Smith was. But he was nice. We, you know, he gave us the Oklahoma City tour and he came he's a horse guy enough. He was at every workout session. He watched us the whole show. And I still didn't know who Delmar Smith was, except that he was a really nice guy who had dogs. And at the end of the show, I'm packing up the trailer, and he came over and he real quietly put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, you're a good trainer. And he walked away. <laughs> now, to me, I was thinking that was nice. It wasn't until a couple of years later that I realized exactly who I was talking to. <laughs> and now I wish I could go back and do it over because I have a million questions. Uh, well, I'm sure he'd take your call. <laughs> well, he, he would. He used to come visit. I used to winter in Oklahoma at Ronnie yeah. and Susanna's place in Big Cabin when oh, they yeah. were in South Texas. And Delmer would always come out and hang out for a few days, so... I got to tell you a funny Delmer story. You know, I, I, I first knew him as a, uh, as a dog trainer. He was legendary. Everybody else knows that too. Um, but Except I, me. <laughs> yeah, back then, but you can relate. And this is the reason I'm telling you, you were in OKC. I used to work OKC when the NFR was there and, uh, and he, I don't think he ever did it, but, uh, but somehow through a, believe it or not, a public radio show, um, uh, they had a feature on it called not my job or something like that. And, uh, and they featured this guy, Delmar Smith, rodeo gate man. And if you're in the rodeo business, you know what that is. If you yeah. do, if you don't, it's, it's a guy who basically pushes the cabs out for the team ropers. Um, yep. uh, anyhow. So the first time I get to meet Delmar at a pheasant fest, um, I said, Oh, it's a pleasure to meet you. I've I've heard all about you. You have an incredible background. How'd you get into rodeo? And he looks at me with a blank face because, of course, we're at a bird dog thing. Anyway, it was you had to be there, I guess. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah. So it was funny because in Big Cabin, he'd come out, and I was doing a lot more retrievers, and he'd watch a drill. And he'd say, what are you trying to accomplish? And I'd talk, we'd talk about it. And then he'd say, well, what about trying this? He'd always come up with an idea. Uh-huh. And it's always – the retrieve, it's funny because the retriever people and the pointing dog people have their own ways of doing things, and a lot of times things don't cross over. Yeah. And so a lot of the things he brought to the table that helped me were things that – you know, I have a foot in both camps, so to speak, which is kind of neat because I can pull information from either direction. And that was a big help. And a lot of the things he'd mention are things that retriever people would not even consider. Well, you know, that's the fun part about, you know, cross-species training uh, backgrounds. And, and again, back to that whole idea of horses 
Uh, there's probably things you learned watching horses and he learned. And, and that, that's another thing is, you know, the best dog trainers like the best horse, because I watched a lot of horse trainers as well. We were in that world for quite a while. Like you glad, because when you get stuck in a stall with a the dog, they're never going to be able to squeeze you against the wall and kill you. But, um, <laughs> but um, th- they watch, they don't say anything. They just watch for a while. And yep. then out of that comes something that sometimes is, is a revelation. Have you had any of those going, whether oh, it's going gosh. retriever to pointer or horse to dog? Very much so. Um, when I was really little, I got my first pony when I was about three and a half. Hey. And of course my dad would put me on and lead me around a little bit and then I'd fall off and he'd put me back up and I'd fall off again. But then he ended up going into business for himself, got really busy and he had no real time to help me with anything. So I was on my own by the time I was about five or six. If I wanted to ride, I just had to do it. And I spent a lot of time as a lawn dart, (laughs) a lot. And I was so frustrated because I had nobody to teach me and nobody to help me. And so I would just sit in the pasture with the ponies. I'd just sit there and watch them interact because we had three or four at the time. And after a while, I started to pick up on little things, little body language things they were doing and how the other ponies would react, you know, just little things like just moving a leg or moving an ear, you know, things, little things, tiny detail body language stuff. And I started working that into the things I did, and I got better. (laughs) I fell off less. I started to relate to the horses the way the horses wanted to be related to. And I've carried that forward into dogs because their language is all body language. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, that, there, and there you go. Uh, we, we talk football or we're thinking about happy hour or something else when we should be paying attention to the dog, right? Oh, you know, they would be really, really poor poker players because they have so many tells that we miss. Yeah. Well, hey, I wrote a book about that. In fact, it's coming out in paperback any day now. But really? the original title was What the Dogs Taught Me. And and I do have I have a little chapter on tells and and they're so useful if we just pay attention. Oh, hugely. So, um what's the biggest mistake we amateur dog trainers make? We talk too much. To the dog. Yes. So what should we do instead? Well, use body language. Yeah. Um, If we're quiet, talking, if you've watched those old Charlie Brown cartoons on TV and the adults talk, it's wah, wah, wah. (laughs) That's what the dog hears. They hear this lengthy bunch of sounds that means absolutely nothing. We think they should respond to that, and it just falls apart. They certainly do learn to pick out words and they learn what certain sounds mean after a while, but it's so much easier if we can relate to them the way they relate to each other, and that's completely different culture from ours. So the problem most people have is they don't respect the culture, that dog's culture, and they expect them to be little people in fursuits. It doesn't work. Okay, so I want to I wanna drill down a little bit. So what is the dog culture and how do we respect it better? Okay. If you watch, if you turn a couple dogs out to play together, I've never seen another dog walk over another to a dog and say, excuse me, would you move over? They just walk up and body slam each other. Yeah. To them, that is polite behavior. To us, we're being mean or we're being rude. That's a good... Um, Simple things like that. If a dog wants to go a certain way, they don't go around the other dog. They go where they want to go and any dog that is submissive to them will get out of the way just automatically just by body posture we always tiptoe around or step over or step back when we should be going forward and that puts us in a leadership position rather than a submissive position now it's a matter of degree and i i get it and i and i'm practicing that every day myself as best i can but it's a it's a matter of the spirit in which you do those things is it can't be vindictive it can't be aggressive it just needs to be business like am i am i on the right track confident yes confident um i had a couple call me from milwaukee this is three or four years ago now they had a big male chessy intact and he sounded like an absolute terror he was growling and biting and knocking people over i mean he just sounded awful and they wanted to know if i could help 
And I said, bring him up. But from what they sounded like on the phone, I was really expecting a horror show. Mm-hmm. So I made sure I had a heavy jacket and gloves. And <laughs> I mean, I seriously, if I was going to have to tangle yeah. with this dog. So they pull in the driveway, they pop the back of their SUV, and I put on my best, you know, kind of confident posture as I'm walking toward the dog. The dog stops, looks at me, and lays down and rolls over on his back. And I thought, this dog is not a problem. He has a people problem. Yeah. Which was the actual problem. The, the, the issue there was the people were not willing to step up in a way that dog would understand. So I took the dog and I rehomed him to some people that just get along great. You, you, you know, it, it, there is some truth to the idea that uh, certain dogs, certain breeds need to match their owners a little bit better and it doesn't happen near as much you you i would bet you get those situations quite frequently you know i do but again a lot of times if you can educate the people if you can if they can watch the way the dog reacts to me and then if they can copy that and it's hard for people to make that transition because it's a foreign language to them Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, gosh it's if they can step up, it'll work. If they aren't willing to, uh, actually, years ago, Jake from Pointing Dog Journal referred a lady to me. This has got to be 10 years ago at least, who was having a problem with her dog. They lived out in Pennsylvania, I believe, and they'd always had golden retrievers, but they decided to have, get to try a new breed. So they have this dog. It's bouncing off the walls in the house. It's chasing all the birds in the backyard. It's just driving them nuts, and they wanted to know what they could do to change that. And I said, well, it sounds like the dog needs exercise. (laughs) Well, we walk it around the block every night. And I said, well, no, that's not going to work. Well, then finally I asked the important question. And these people were not hunters at all. And they lived in the suburbs. What kind of dog did you get? Well, we got an English pointer. (laughs) And I said, okay. I said, if you're not going to hunt the dog and you're not going to give the dog several miles of run. I mean, they're the marathon runners of the dog world. I said, Call the breeder, send the dog back, and get another golden retriever. Mm-hmm. But we love her. I said, if you're not willing to do what the dog needs, then you really don't love her. You love the idea of her. And I, the lady was crying. She's very upset. I never did hear how it turned out, but it was the wrong, completely the wrong dog for the situation. But they bought it because it looked cool. And, and you know, there are breeders out there who would be glad to take that money. Yeah, and that's wrong too. Don't get me started. But I, me either, me either. I, I screen very carefully when I sell puppies. So you know, uh, uh, you just touched on something that is is near and dear to my heart, and that is, I learned this with my first wire hair. Whenever we had a discipline problem, a, a behavioral problem, he hadn't had his five miles of running that day. Yeah, a tired dog is a good dog, but even so, they do get to a point where you can still control that energy before you get to the exercise point. You have to. And here, they have to go, they have to earn their way loose in the field. They don't just get to go through that gate and go run. Talk to me about that. If they can't walk, well, if they can't walk next to me at heel on a loose command lead, Mm -hmm. I'm not turning them loose because they're not in control and they're not focused on me and they're not a team player. So we might spend five minutes, we might spend 30 seconds. When they're walking, they're looking up at me and stopping when I stop, moving either direction. Great, go have some fun. If they're not, we're going to straighten that out, and it's especially critical when you go hunting. If that dog is bouncing off the walls in the crate in the truck, here's what happens usually. You get to the place you're going to hunt. They pop open the crate door, let the dog run around and do its thing while they get their shotgun and their vest and their shells. The dog is completely out of control to begin with. So I do it the reverse way. Mm -hmm. My shotgun might be on the tailgate of the truck, but everything else is ready. The dog gets on the command lead. We might only walk 20 yards. Yeah. If the dog is focused, great, let's turn loose and hunt him up. If the dog is wild and crazy, we're going to spend a couple minutes reminding him they are not self-employed and they will focus on me as a team. I am practicing that every day. Our, our, big, ba- our, our big bane right now is walking at heel. And Ronnie reminded me of this four years ago, and, and I'm still working on it with this guy. But uh, we all know what they want to do what we need to do is check me on this is we need to demonstrate that to get to that destination, you have to do some things first. Am I on the right Right. track? 
Absolutely, they have to earn it. Yes, I love. And that. what it really what it really ends up being is problem solving. You're teaching mm-hmm. the dog. The dog knows what it wants to do. It has to problem solve. What do I have to do to get what I want? Give me one more concrete example of that in a training situation. Um, doesn't matter. Steadiness, retrieving, whatever it is. Start back on the chain gang. Yeah. If the dog's bouncing around, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna ignore it. Yeah. When it stands still, I move closer. That dog, what really happens, I wish I could get into the dog's mind to see how it really worked, but what I think happens is the dog understands after a bit that if it stands still, I'll come over and pet it on the shoulders. Yeah. So it says, hey, if I stand still, I can manipulate Sharon into coming over and petting me on the shoulders. I think you wrote not several weeks, not in the current edition of PDJ, that um, the dog thinks he's training you, but... Really, right. I don't care as long as we get what we want. <laughs> exactly. I love that. Hey, man, we have got a lot more to cover uh, besides French horns and tubas. Um, but uh, Sue, you're going to get, uh, Sharon, you're going to get a, a, a brief break here while I make a couple commercial announcements. We'll be back with Sharon Potter of Red Branch, Red Branch Kennels and uh, Pointing Dog Journal. We're going to cover the Upland Nation Glossary with the letter P and your names. No, no. And then we're going to talk about the bad habits that you all have, or at least are willing to confess to. So Sharon, Sharon, hold on for just a moment and uh, we'll be right back. The rest of you pay close attention because we've got a lot to talk about. First off, that project of mine, Fur Feathers Friends. Sharon talked about something interesting right there that I, I think is really important. And that is dogs are ambassadors to, especially to folks who are unfamiliar with what we do. And that was the whole genesis of the Fur Feathers Friends project about six or seven years ago. It's become a sem- somewhat annual project now. If you want to learn more about it, go to furfeathersfriends.com. Find out how you can employ your dog to bring someone else along on a hunting trip and get them excited about this great sport and the conservation that comes from bringing a new hunter into the sport. And very soon I'll be awarding the first of several hunt ready strap vests. If you haven't seen them, take a look at all the hunt ready strap vests at fur feathersfriends.com sign on you don't need to make a serious commitment you just need to tell me who you're going to take somewhere this season at fur feathers what did i say fur feathersfriends.com and if you are hitting the road make sure your dog is protected in a roughland kennel r-u-f-f roughlandkennels.com learn more about the race car inspired rough flex energy dissipation technology some of those other kennels with rigid double walls mean your dog crashes against the wall from the inside rough land kennels walls flex you know they were the pioneers in roto molded dog crates so um if you're looking for somebody who's figured it all out and i mean figured it out because they are bird hunters and they know what they're talking about plus all the accessories learn more at rough landkennels.com Oh boy, now we're warmed up. We can't talk music, but we can talk bird dogs and bird dog training once again with Sharon Potter of Red Branch Kennels, Pointing Dog Journal writing team, along with Rick Smith. Sharon, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Uh, you know, we, 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 we have drilled down in a couple areas that I really like, but I really want you to tell me what are some of the bits of gear that you think we should have that we probably don't have? Doesn't take much, really. Yeah. Um, of course, the command lead is number one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's an invaluable tool. Um, you need a good quality e-collar. Do not go on the cheap. Okay. Um, bird launchers. <laughs> Keep going. You're, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about my Christmas list here. (laughs) 
Well, there, there are two kinds. Um, there are the standard kind with the, they're spring loaded and you can launch the bird, which is great because if you need a, if a dog that wants to creep or whatever, you can get that bird out of there. Yeah. The other kind I use, I've got a couple of the old, they, they were originally Higgins launchers. I'm yeah. not sure what they're calling them now, but they have a real slow hydraulic open rather than a launch. So you mm-hmm. get a more natural flush. Uh, so having that stuff, you know, having two or three launchers is, is important. Uh, a check cord, you need a good quality check cord. Not one of the flat ones, the flimsy ones. What I do, it's just hardware store rope with a yeah. good snap and a bowline not tied. But dunk it in a bucket of water, let it soak, and let it leave it outside. My check cords hang outside 365 days a year. So they get wet and dried, and they never tangle. They're stiff. Yeah. It's easier to flip them over a dog's back as you're check cording. Um, I do not like limp, floppy check cords. And I need something that's substantial enough that you can hold it without getting rope burn. Yeah, yeah. And I might and just add, good thing too. yeah, the, the stiffness thing really pays off if your dog is dragging it through, say, a sagebrush pasture, where if he makes a hard turn, it doesn't get caught around one of the stubs in the sage. It doesn't wrap itself around and stop the dog. That's right. The, That's the thing I like most about a stiff check cord. I want to get back to the launchers for a minute because this is something that's near and dear to my heart. I have, I have a whole bunch of them and I use them a lot for the very reason that I think you described, but tell me how you would employ them with a dog that roads in on a bird. Well, the first thing you've got to have is a dog that understands how to stop. Yeah. And that has nothing to do with birds. Mm Mm-hmm. If they don't have a solid woe, and we use a flank collar and the woe post system to get there, if you don't have a dog that you can stop anywhere, and this is, has nothing to do and should not be used around birds, you're not ready for that step. When you do have a dog that you can stop, you take it out, you let it work the field, as it should stop and hold on first scent. If it does not and it starts to roll in and creep, you launch the bird. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you do not stop the dog on the collar when it's creeping in on the bird. Yeah. You do not want that connection with the bird. Mm-hmm. So the dog is going to break and chase, probably. If they stop, that's good. But if they break and chase, you roll them to a stop after they've committed to running. You put them back in front into the scent cone again? No. The bird's gone. Okay. So that's... I want them to stop. Their job at that point is to stop and mark where that bird's going. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then we'll go on and work the next bird, and usually the next bird they're going to hold on. What have they taught themselves at that point? That if they move, the bird goes away. Mm-hmm. The fun's over. Mm-hmm. You mentioned Brad Higgins, and and I'm a big believer in a lot of his philosophies. If only he'd come on the show sometime. Hey, Brad, if you're listening, please come on. I'm trying to change his mind. Anyway, Brad's big on on the ultimate reward, whether whether it's in that situation or others, and it usually involves a bird of one sort or another. How how do you how do you cope with the idea of the dog is really only after one thing, and that's to get a bird in his mouth, I think. Check me if I'm wrong, but what do you do next in the transaction? When do you introduce dead birds as a reward, for example? A lot is going to depend on the individual dog. Yeah. Uh, if I have a dog, like, all right, we had what I call the COVID puppies. Mm-hmm. Two years of puppies mm-hmm. that didn't go anywhere, weren't socialized, were scared of the whole world. So those dogs are going to get a wing clip bird, um, usually quail, especially for the smaller dogs and puppies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, or I'll use chuckers. I'll clip the wings. I'll let them chase and grab it. I yeah. want them to get a bird in their mouth so they know what birds are and they get excited about them. Yeah. After that, then we can go on to, okay, now you have to find the bird and smell it. And I don't worry again about getting a bird in their mouth until I've got the dog steady. Then I'll start knocking down a bird for them. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, and at that point, they are on a check cord because I really don't want them to grab the bird and chase it around the field. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, running is not my favorite thing to do. So, <laughs> uh, but I want them to get a bird in their mouth, but they have to earn it. Again, it's a series of steps. And if they break, there's no shot, there's no bird, and there's no reward. So eventually, it all pieces together. Every dog is going to be different. Some dogs are very natural retrievers, and we can get to that process in that first season. Others are not, and we may say, get through your first season, work about working, work on the birds, then let's come back and do the train retrieve training. 
Got it. Yeah. Um, I, what I've noticed in helping other people with their dogs is that that whole bird introduction seems to be a, well, you know, I, I see it all the time. I'll go to a training day and it'll be the only day that month that that dog has had a bird contact. Mm-hmm. So if, if okay. we, if we're going to try and obviously we should all own more birds, but if we can't, are there other ways we can deal with that? Well, it takes birds to make a bird dog, and yeah. there's really no way around that. Uh, I mean, even I've got one client, they live in town, and their dog likes to chase robins in the backyard. Mm-hmm. Now, on if, when they come to train, the dog is steady, but they let it chase the robins. And I said, why are you letting it chase the robins? It's yeah, but, a bird. Yeah, how do you stop steady that, Steady him though? in your backyard. Okay, so. The same way you would in the field. You go back to your wool training, yeah. let him point it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when you have the opportunity yeah i love it you know if you have to go to a game farm you know where i put and take kind of place Mm -hmm. let your dog get into birds you've got to have birds you can do all the training in the world but if they don't make the connection if you're not using some birds so now you've got to find a way now we're in the field you and i are hunting along and and my dog is in front of us and yours is um just mad at you because you won't let him or her hunt with us but my dog um something's going to go off the rails while while we're hunting and he was perfect in every training version of that what is that going to usually be breaking on a on a bird yeah on a bird yeah what do we do at that point well the first season, that rookie season, is the important one because what you've got to do, and this is really hard for people to do, especially if they're going to a place where they've made a, a long trip or they're paying, you know, twenty dollars mm-hmm. a bird, yeah. you're not going to shoot. Yeah. You're going to pass up shots. You're going to correct the dog just like you did in training because they know the difference between a training scenario and a hunting situation. And the hunting is way more exciting, way more fun. And if you don't make the corrections there. You're telling them they're two different things and the rules don't apply when they hunt. So they're always wearing an e-collar. By this time, it's gone from the flank to the neck. If they break on a bird, I'm not going to shoot. I'm going to reach in my pocket, grab my transmitter, and I'm going to stop the dog when it chases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That first season, if you do that the first couple of hunts, you'll square the dog up and you'll probably have a pretty good season. But if you let it go or you say, I paid for that bird, I'm going to shoot it, you just taught the dog the rules don't count in the real world. Yeah, it's a, it's a somewhat ex- expensive lesson, but it pays off for the dog's entire lifetime. Absolutely. What do you take on a bird hunt that uh, we probably haven't got in our vest? Oh, gosh. I've always got a handful of simple first aid stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, literally a handful, but I always take a couple of the um, grocery store frozen or just water bottles, squeeze bottles, and I put them in the freezer. Yeah. And that way I've got cold water for the dogs when they come back to check in. Um, There's not that much. I will tell you that if you're carrying your shells and you're shooting a 20 gauge and you carry them in your pocket, do not put your chapstick in the same pocket because it will go right down through the barrel. (laughs) Uh, okay, let's make a note of that, among other things. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> you're you're telling me that because it um, you saw it happen to somebody else, right? Uh, no, I will admit <laughs> to that one. Mhm. Mhm. So I'm um, I'm going, I'm I'm shopping for a dog, um, puppy, because. You know, everybody who listens to this probably wants to start and create a relationship. So we want a, a puppy. Um, what are we What are we looking for, and who can help us with that the best? And I, I know it's a leading question. The the breeder quite often is going to tell you that's your dog, like it or lump it. But what do we look for when we're there and the the pup is five weeks old, milling around with the rest of its litter? What are the things that are important to uh, to a bird hunter and the things we should watch for when that pup is really young like that? Well, there are a lot of changes that happen between five weeks and seven and eight weeks, but I want the pup that's bold. 
the pup that'll go off away from the rest of the litter and explore. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm looking for, like with my puppies, I've got a litter of not quite two week old Chessie pups in the house right now. When it's time for them to go out in the field when they're five weeks old or so, I'm going to wing clip a quail and I'm going to let the whole pack chase it. Yeah. And I don't care what they do with it. Um, but I want that if I'm picking a puppy, I want the puppy that sees a bird for the first time and goes, Oh my God, I have to have it. And they just go nuts. If the puppy backs up, looks at it and walks away, it's going to still be a nice dog for somebody else. I want, yeah. I like the over the top riding the edge of disaster kind myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now that's not the right dog for most people. Yeah. The ones that take the turns on two wheels. Yeah. And the flip side of that is when people are, especially if it's their first dog, they're looking at all the titles, the championships, you know, the field titles, and they want as much of that packed in there as they can get. And they want, they think they want that high roller dog and they don't, and I won't sell them one. So it it, it it's, does get back to trusting the breeder in, in large part. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I used to let people pick, but what happens is then the person that has the first deposit in, they have their first pick. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean best puppy, best puppy for who? Yeah. But they're going to pick the one that happened to lick their face or chew on their shoelace because it was cute or it attracted their attention. And that has nothing to do with the personality. You know, I know those puppies because I've lived with them for eight weeks. I know who is the laid back one, who is the wild child that's going to get into trouble. And I want to make sure that it's successful. And since I've started doing the choosing, haven't had a complaint yet. That's Sharon Potter. Redbranchkennels.net is where you learn more about her. I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation podcast. Sharon, let's go back to that because this is, we have at this moment, uh, many, many listeners who have 15, 18, 20 week old puppies at home. What do you think that they need? What are, what are they potentially ignoring, forgetting to do that is critical at that point in a young dog's life? Structure. Yeah. yeah and, and fair discipline. There are things you can start. I mean, my puppies, they're, they're in the house again. You pick up a little puppy at eight weeks and you hold on to it and it licks your face and it sits there. And then all of a sudden it starts to wiggle and squirm and it wants you to put it down. And so you put it down. Oh, hold it. Hold You're it. Shaping, hold it. Hold it. First off, you pick it up. Puppy, well, yeah, okay, puppy the puppy, breath. yeah, the puppy breath. Yeah, okay, gotta have then that. after that, go ahead. <laughs> so this pup, <laughs> this puppy wiggles and squirms and wants you to put it down. So we say, okay, and we put it on the ground. Yeah, we're shaping negative behavior right there. We're telling that puppy that the way to get what it wants is to wiggle and squirm and jump around. Mm-hmm. I'm going to hold that puppy until it relaxes, and then I will set it on the ground. So shaping a little behavior, everybody wants their puppy on their lap and doing all sorts of cute puppy stuff, but then all of a sudden they get to a certain age and that's no longer acceptable. If it's not going to be acceptable in the adult dog, it should not be allowed when they're puppies. Yeah. You know, uh, Larry Mueller might have been the first guy to talk about that, but maybe not. But this whole idea of a young skull full of mush, that's the time to mold it, pardon the pun, isn't it? Absolutely. It, It certainly is because... You're teaching it how to behave in your situation, and they don't understand why the rules changed all of a sudden. Mm. They don't get it. What is the typical violation at uh, at a year old? What is the dog? What What are many dogs going to do wrong that we could have fixed early on? Oh gosh, <laughs> I have to pick one. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> let's. I got all day. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well. Um, right, let's retrieving is a great one because everybody wants to throw a ball for the puppy to chase, right? Yeah. So obviously, if you do it in a hallway with the doors closed and you're at the end of the other end of the hallway, the puppy has one route, and that's straight back to you. So do it twice. Do not do it more than twice, because the first time the puppy will come back to you. The second time the puppy will come back to you, maybe a little slower. If you do it the third time, that's when the puppy says, "I'm going to lay over here and chew on this." Yeah. So you're teaching them they have options. Don't teach them they have options. Take that ball the third time, wave it around, and put it away. And you can come back 10 minutes later and do the same thing again. You can do it a lot, but only do two at a time. Because you're creating a habit, and the puppy says the way the game is played is they throw it, I bring it back, they throw it. They don't know there's another option. 
you're talking about thinking literally, I mean, like a dog, think like a dog. And, and what is a dog thinking? I mean, it's almost always linear and literal, isn't it? Well, it very much so. They, they, they're not that complicated. In order to learn dog language, we, it's not like we expect them to memorize the Oxford Dictionary. And they don't, we don't need to do that. There's only maybe a dozen things or a few more that we need to really focus on, and that's the body language stuff. You can tell by looking at that puppy's eyes when it grabs the ball for the third time if it's going to bring it back or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's really easy if you start paying attention. Yeah. Uh, a behaviorist friend of mine opened my eyes to that five dogs ago. He said, don't be a greedy owner. And I said, what? You know, most of the time when you're lobbing those balls out there, it, you're showing off to everybody else. The dog figures right. that out. Just don't do it. Right. Well, and whatever you're going to do, be, this is my current pointing dog journal article that mm-hmm. I've got to get done today. <laughs> um, be you consistent. heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> be consistent. Yeah. You know, dogs keep score. If all right, the example I'm using, I, I'm going to cheat a little bit and give a little tell on this article. All right, you've got your dog in the crate in the back of your truck. You open the door, and the dog should stand there as that door opens. It shouldn't jump out onto the tailgate. That's what you've trained. So you've done it five times. The dog's done it perfectly. And then you're in a hurry one day, and you open the crate door, and the dog jumps out off the tailgate onto the ground without following the rules. And you're in a hurry, so you let it go. The score is owner five. Now the dog has a point, and they're going to try it again the next time because they got away with it the first time they do keep score <laughs> and they learn it's, it's behavior patterns and what you allow is what you're training whether you intend to or not every interaction you have with a dog is a training exercise what you allow is what they learn yes i'm i'm going to tattoo that on my left inner forearm because that is that is a great way to think about how dogs think well it, it works yeah. And you know, having the people stop doing what they're doing and pay attention to the dog. I've got a great story about that if you've got time. I do. <laughs> I've got – Mike won't mind if I tell it. Um, I've got a client out in California. He has a really cool yellow lab named Molly. This was several years ago now, probably 10 or 11 years ago. And he's a terrific guy, but he's used to giving orders, and he's not used to taking them. And I had trained the dog, and I was going to be wintering in Big Cabin, Oklahoma, and he was going to drive out from California and meet me there and spend three days learning how to run the dog. And he would not listen to a thing I told him. Um, he was frustrated. The dog worked beautifully for me, and by the time he stopped doing what I was telling him to, the dog completely flipped him off and wouldn't acknowledge him even. Mm-hmm. Two days into this, I'm frustrated, he's frustrated, and I can't make the guy listen. Meanwhile, Ronnie and Susanna get home from South Texas, and Ronnie mentions the guy's name, and <laughs> he sa- I said, how do you know him? And he said, he's hard to teach. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I know, I'm really struggling with this. So I did one of my, the last day he was going to be there, I woke up at 3 in the morning with an idea. And at the time, I was using a Garmin collar with a tone function. So when Mike got there to work his dog that morning, I took my second collar, and I hung it real loose around Mike's neck like a necklace. <laughs> and I said, Mike, every time... You do something that doesn't make sense or is incorrect, you're going to hear beep, beep. Well, two minutes in, it was beep, 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 beep. And he got mad at me, and he swung around and yelled at me, and he said, would you stop that? And I said, I'll stop doing that to you if you stop doing that to your dog. And he got really quiet, and he shut up, and he started to listen, and the dog worked well for him, and he went home real happy. So it worked out well that way. So I got back in the house, and Ronnie said, how'd it go? And I said, piece of cake, collared the client. Yeah. <laughs> Kids, <laughs> don't try this best, at home. <laughs> well, it's just the tone function. But the best part is he has a great piece of property up in Oregon, and he flew me out there to do a retriever seminar that summer. He came to the line with his dog, Molly, the first day, and he had I've got pictures for proof of this. He had a piece of duct tape over his mouth with just a slit for the whistle. <laughs> Uh, self-training thought, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it worked out but it's a matter of doing things in a manner that makes sense to the dog and being consistent in your expectations and in your actions you know you're, you're all of this is so fundamental 
but we never think about it because we think like human beings and not like dogs. Dogs are fundamental. They're primeval. They're, they're all the things that we have evolved away from. And that's probably a lesson to take away from all of this. You, would you agree? Yes, absolutely. Good. On that note, I'm going to thank you, Sharon Potter of Red Branch Kennels. Dot net is where you learn more about her. Part of the Huntsmith team, including the writing side of things with Rick in Pointing Dog Journal, among other things. I am so, I can't wait to talk music with you off mic sometime, but we'll also talk again on the podcast. Thanks so much for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. I've enjoyed every single minute. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I've enjoyed it as well. All right. Have a great day. You too. And we've got a lot more to come, including, uh, well, all of your bad habits. Well, okay, I'll start with one of my bad habits. And then the Upland Nation Glossary, the letter P, is coming up after a couple quick announcements. The first for Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food. He's got one for any life stage, any kind of activity level. Learn more at drtims.com. Always free delivery. 30% discount on your first order. Just use the code Upland Nation at D R T I M S dot com. And then if you're looking for apparel and maybe you can't find your size, your color, the style, whatever it is, here's another alternative for you Mid Valley Clays dot com. Dave and Chris and Vandy and the crew over there have a extensive inventory of brands from Beretta to Shooter King, Wild Hair, Browning, Shoot the Moon, and Ms. Mac. They're all available, maybe in sizes and colors and styles that you can't find anywhere else. Learn more at midvalleyclays.com. Time for the Upland Nation Glossary. We're to the letter P. If you have any suggestions, share them with me at the Wing Shooting USA or the Upland Nation Facebook pages. The P I chose from our glossary. I didn't take a P from my glossary. No. Yes, I did. <laughs> uh, is Pen Hip. That's P E N N H I P. Pen Hip. It's a method from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, their vet school has come up with a great X ray based version of evaluating the potential for hip dysplasia in dogs. It's kind of a measurement system. There's another one out there as well. The or Orthopedic Foundation for Animals or the OFA has one as well. They're the two that most breed testing organizations will rely on. They measure hip laxity. Don't ask me what that means, but there, there's a space in those hips, in the joints, and that's what they're doing is they're putting a the tape measure to it, literally. And those ratings are then provided to the breeder or the buyer, depending on who's paying for it, so that you can select the best hips for breeding future generations of dogs with the least risk of hip dysplasia. That's pen hip. And this is fast becoming my favorite part of the Upland Nation podcast. I ask you a question on Facebook and you give me a lot of great answers. And here's a few for you. The question was, mine is looking at the damn GPS handheld too frequently instead of enjoying the view. What bird hunting bad habit do you want to break? And boy, did we get some good ones. Thank you all for uh, for your honesty. Jerry Steeman looks at the ground for things he can trip over way too often instead of all the other great stuff out there. Um, John Hyde, echoing Sharon Potter's advice, I he, he says, I agree with many here about talking too much to their pups. She was very shy and would just walk at my side. That's his newest setter. When he realized he was trying to um, help her in his training sessions, he would shut up and she would start to become a little bit more bold. I get the idea. There are many times. Oh, Bill Evans, thank you. Great picture. I have it still on my wall. You know which one I'm talking about. 
that is just so inspiring. And if you haven't seen it, go to the Facebook page and see Bill's picture. Lance Larson says his bad habit is worrying too much about mistakes. His dog or he commit in the field, not just having fun. Enjoy the day. Yes, indeed. Travis Hampton, thank you for the reminder. I'll be at the the range the day after tomorrow. He says his bad habit is rushing the shot and rushing to approach the birds. Travis Power says, get a Garmin watch and take in every view. Bill Evans, again, wishes he used his camera more. Yeah, I understand. I'm in the business, and I don't hardly even carry mine when I'm hunting for fun. <clears throat> Let's see. One or two. Time for one or two more bad habits. Yeah. Eric Sextonson says, my bad habit is talking to my dog while he's working on birds. Overcorrection or commands. Absolutely. Miles Burdett, again, <clears throat> pardon me. Shooting at birds that weren't pointed. Larry Davenport, we'll leave it at this one. A lesson for everybody here. His bad habit is not going bird hunting often enough. Thank you all. Appreciate your honesty. I know some of you were answering for a friend, but uh, it helps for us to take a look at ourselves once in a while. All right, let me just remind you that uh, I'll be there, and I hope you can join us too here on South Dakota. They call themselves Ringneck Nation for a reason. More birds than people in here on South Dakota and the surrounding 124,000 acres of public access. If you'd like more information, learn more about the festival or the Ringneck Festival and Bird Dog Challenge, access points, all sorts of maps, discounts, information of all sorts. Just go to Hunt here on sd.com and finally thank you to all of those who've left ratings and reviews about the upland nation podcast keep them coming that's how we grow one review at a time thank you all for listening and thank you all of our sponsors who make all of this possible roughland performance kennel sage and breaker gun care products Pointer Shotguns, Dr. Tim's Performance Dog Food, Mid-Valley Clays, the Ringneck Nation of Huron-South Dakota, and, of course, visit my FurFeathersFriends.com website and learn more about taking somebody else hunting this year. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Until next time, maybe I'll see you at a training day.